Well, good morning, Fly Church. Thank you for being here today. And my guess is most of you walked in the very first time because of an invitation. And I want to say thank you. Thank you for being willing to invite your friends and your family. There's places you've gone to eat before that you don't invite people to come to with you because it's, you, you don't like it that much. There's other places you've been where you, don't, you, you go, no, I've been there, but no, you, you might want to go somewhere else. When you invite someone, that's like the biggest pat on the back you can give your church and your staff and the people that serve around here. So I want to say thank you. I also want to say thank you. If you've been coming for more than two years, you probably participated in our first Christmas offering. And two years ago, the number one need on our Christmas offering was to be able to hire a full-time children's pastor. And Marissa has been here for over a year. And I want to say thank you for that. If you were here last year for our Christmas offering, our number one item on that was to be able to add another staff member so that we could go ahead. We ended up bringing on Eli as a youth and college pastor. And I want to say thank you for helping us to get to beyond where we were. Because every, every step we've ever taken over the past 10 years has getting us beyond where we've been. And can you take a look at your life and realize that you've gone beyond where you thought you would be? Come on, some of you, you look in the mirror today. I pulled up something on, on, my, on my computer and it had my age listed next to me. I'm going, seriously, I'm 50? It's like, wow, it hadn't hit me until I saw it. It's like, wow, we go beyond and we keep moving forward. This morning, as we tie in a little bit to our end of the ending of the year with strength and anticipation on what's coming forward for the next year, we're talking a little bit about going beyond our capacity. Uh, Paul, in the Bible passage we're going to look at, Paul's taking an offering. He's, he's writing to the church in Corinth. It's the third letter that he wrote. One of them was lost in 2 Corinthians. And he's writing to the church in Corinth, and he's talking about an offering. And we're going to pick it up in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Paul says this, Hey, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Out of the most severe trial, their overwhelming joy, and their extreme poverty welled up into rich generosity. For I testified that they gave as much as they were able even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, that's someone they sent with the letter, since he had earlier made a beginning, he started collecting the money, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. Hey, Corinthian church, just as you excel in everything, faith, speech, knowledge, earnestness, and your love for us also excel in the grace of giving. I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it to the earnestness of others. Let's start by talking about the Macedonian church. Obviously, the Macedonian church was a church that was in the town of Macedonia. Man, you guys are brilliant, man. Brilliant, brilliant. I'm going to show you my GPA later in this message, and you're going to go, ha, I'm twice that. I've got twice that GPA. The, uh, what the Macedonian church lacked, they gave. And after they gave, they were able to give more than they could give. They, what did they have? They had severe trial. Severe trial. And their overflowing joy and extreme poverty. How do those two words go together? I know what joy is. No one's ever accused me of being someone overflowing with joy. Overflowing with energy sometimes. Yeah, I get that. I get that. People ask me, so what coffee do you drink? Diet Dr. Pepper. Not coffee. The, uh, but in extreme poverty, I, I have a vague idea what poverty is like, although I would never look in the eye and say I was, I was totally poor. And most people that, that have been what I consider to be poor, when you ask them, they don't think they're poor. No one's told them they're poor yet. But extreme poverty? And it came into rich generosity? Why were, they, why were they so poor anyways? Their land, the land of Macedonia, was ravaged by war. One of the blessings America has had is we've had very few battles on our own land. Most all of our wars have been fought on someone else's backyard and not our own. There were battles on their soil. They had heavy taxation, and Rome came and stripped them of all their natural resources out of their land. So Macedonian church had no comfort, but a lot of joy. What do we say at Christmas time? Comfort and joy. They actually don't go together. Think with me for a moment. Can you have joy and not have comfort? And I love comfort. I love a hammock in the backyard, you know, 60 degrees, a little bit of a breeze. Oh yeah, oh yeah. A little bit of cloud blocking the sun. I love comfort. But can you have joy and not have comfort? Come on, come on. And do you know people who have tons of comfort, but they got no joy? Yeah. Hear me clearly. Comfort is not a prerequisite to have joy. Man, if I could just get that... Fill in the blank here for Christmas. That's not necessary to have joy. Oh, you'd like to have it, and you'd be joyous the moment you have it, but pretty soon that brand new phone's going to be two months old. 
And all of a sudden, it's not going to give you the joy that it once did. The Macedonian church, their conditions did not determine their capacity. Hear me clearly. Their conditioning determined their capacity. And think conditioning like you're training for a physical event. You're training for a football season or wrestling season. Their conditions did not determine their capacity. Their conditioning determined their capacity. And they were already fully conditioned in their hearts and in their mind to be people that were generous and moving forward. I got way ahead of myself on the notes there. Go ahead, all you cheaters can go ahead and fill it in now. Go ahead. And they considered it a privilege to give. Matter of fact, no, I'm going to go backwards. Ha, gotcha. The, uh, they considered it a privilege to give. So much so, watch this, they requested permission to give. So Paul's taking the, uh, this offering because the church in Jerusalem, you guys in this corner of Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem was hurting. The people were poor. The, the city was having difficulty. And all the Christians were being persecuted. So they were, they were they're over there. So Paul goes to the church over here and says, hey, will you help? We, we need to raise funds for this church over here. We need to raise funds for these people. Then Paul goes to the people in Corinth who he's writing to and says, hey, we, we, need, we need to go ahead and, and can we get a collection so we can help the people in Jerusalem? And then he gets to Macedonia and goes, hold on. They already got it rough. They're already like the poorest of the poor. Extreme poverty. Watch this. Paul wasn't going to ask them to give. He was going to skip over them. And they demanded the opportunity to participate with their brothers and sisters. Could you imagine if Flag for our Christmas offering said, hey, if you're 30% of our town on disability, we don't need you to give on this. Matter of fact, you've got so little as is. Why don't you just keep what you got? And just Because you, you got it so difficult. We don't need your help. We don't want your help. You're not needed. You're not necessary. Yes, you can attend, but you're not really a functioning part of the body. How disrespectful. How utterly, not just unkind, but emasculating to tell someone, your contribution doesn't matter. My biggest giving testimony that ever God did something in me was when I was quote-unquote poor. I had the fraction, a half an address. 921 and a half was my address, East Erie Avenue. And that's when God did some of the most amazing things in my life through giving. The Macedonian church did what they were able, then somehow crazily they were able to do what they were not able to do. They did what they were able. And then Paul says they did beyond what they were able. But Paul's not writing to the Macedonian church. He's writing about the Macedonian church to the Corinthian church. And he's basically using the Macedonian church as an example. He's saying, hey, Corinthian church, see these Macedonians? Yeah, that, those Macedonians. Yeah, yeah, that's the real poor one. Yeah, where Rome's been taking all the resources. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's that real poor place. They welled up in rich generosity. Your turn. Will you step up? Because Corinthian church, we all know. All these other churches know. Corinthian church, you're in a major trade route. You, they've got joy. They may not have any comfort, but they've got tons of joy. You've got comfort. How about getting some joy with your comfort? Some joy through generosity. Because we know you've got comfort because Corinth was not hurting financially at all. So let's talk about capacity. Now you can pull your bulletins out. And if you didn't get one when you came in, lift your hand. Our ushers will be ready to hand one to you. Our capacity is limited by conditioning. Not conditions. If you need a bulletin, lift your hand or I'll get one to you. It's limited by conditioning. How much have you worked out physically, spiritually, uh, uh, mentally, socially? Capacity is limited by conditioning, not conditions. In Macedonia, conditions, bad. Conditioning, generosity. And they had been conditioning themselves to be generous. Paul writes, I'm using a different translation now. This was totally spontaneous. It was entirely their own idea, talking about Macedonian church. It caught us completely off guard. What explains it was that they had first given themselves to God and then to us. The other giving towards the church in Jerusalem simply flowed out of the purposes of God working in their life. They had already conditioned themselves to be people who were going to be generous no matter what. They were not waiting for the perfect storm to happen, that all the circumstances would line up and say, okay, now we can give because everything is lined up like it needs to line up. Here's a, here's a book in the Bible we don't quote from too much, Ecclesiastes. Whoever watches the wind, farmer verse, farmer verse, Keith, whoever watches the wind will not plant. Oh, I gotta wait for the wind to be right before I can go ahead and plant. Or whoever watches the wind will not break the leaves in the front yard. The, uh, or they'll wait for the wind to blow them in their neighbor's front yard. Yeah, there we go. Lord, please send the wind. The, uh, and whoever looks at the clouds will never reap. Waiting for the perfect situation. You know, if I could, uh, I would, I would. But you don't. So you can't. 
the Macedonian church, they couldn't, they couldn't give, but they did. And when they did, they found out they could, and they could do more than they could. Question, and it's a little bit of a pushy one. What do I say I can't do that really I just won't do? I can't do that, God. I can't do that. But really, it's not an I can't to do. Honestly, gut level in the mirror, it's that you won't do it. I mean, you could, where do I start here? You could grow spiritually if you, if you would make some effort, but, but you won't grow spiritually, and therefore you don't. You could clean up your foul mouth. Let's go there, let's go there. How many of you, it used to be a practice of you, lots of words came out of your mouth that were not acceptable. I got both hands up. Anyone else in the house? All right. You could clean up your mouth if you would clean up your mouth, but because you don't, you won't. You won't. You could have joy if you would have joy, but you won't have joy because you don't. Pastor, I want to change, but I don't want to be challenged. I, I, I'm going to start giving, but I've got to wait till this happens and this happens and this happens. I'm going to start serving, but it's a busy time in my life right now. You know, holidays and I've got so many needs myself. I'm going to be spiritual, but I don't want to develop any habits that actually invite God's presence into my life. Imagine this instead. Imagine if your conditioning, that what you're doing, your habits that are work, you're working out, was preparing you to increase your capacity instead of helping you stay complacent in your comfort. And I love comfort. I love comfort. But if all I do is stay complacent in my comfort, I will never increase the capacity that God wants to do in me and through me. And that's for all of us. So let's twist this a little bit and start taking a touch more of a positive note. What I can't is now what I do. What in your life used to be, I can't do that. I can't do that. No, I just can't do that. Wow, whoa, I did that. Whoa. Yeah, I do that. That's what I do. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, I can't do that. Are you crazy? That? No way. I'm glad you can do that. God has blessed you to be able to do that. Congratulations. You're gifted by God. I can't do that. Oh, I did that. Oh, yeah, that's what I do. Come on, think and quit, quit uh, uh, demeaning yourself and go, there's nothing. I can't do anything. Stop lying to yourself and listen to the enemy on that. What well, used to be an I can't. That's not what I do. The Macedonian church. Oh, we can't do that. We can't do that. We did that. And we did even more. What are you living in that used to be a dream? Your life right now, looking around. And we don't think it's a dream right now because it's normal life. But 10 years ago, 15 years ago, what are you living in? That you're going, man, it would be so awesome to. And now you're there. I can't, I can't, I can't afford to own a house. And now you're purchasing a house. Oh, I can't. I'm not smart enough to graduate, graduate from college. I can't, I can't graduate. And now you're pursuing that. Let's break it down a little lower. And let's dump the Hollywood empty fantasies and, and shred the comparisons there, man. <sighs> I used to dream I could be drug free and now you look at yourself and you go, whoa. Doesn't feel like a dream because it's just what I do. It's how I live, but I'm drug free now. You used to dream of being able to have a stable mind and not being thrown around by so much emotion that you couldn't hold things together and now you have a stable mind. You used to dream of having cars that started every time you pushed the key in. Come on, anybody? Anybody with me on that? I used to dream of having cars that would start every time you were still, still living the dream. Some of you are still chasing the dream. But now, I can't remember the last time I went to go start a vehicle and it, and it didn't work. And you know what? I'm not thinking I'm in the dream. I take it for granted. But it used to be an I can't. And now it's I can. How about steady job? You had five jobs in four years, and now you've had the same job for four years. What well, used to be, I can't hold down a steady job, and you are. I can't have a healthy marriage, healthy kids. I always wanted to be one of those people that, you know, would go to the same church on a regular basis. When I walk in the door, it'd feel like home, and people would know me, and I would know people. And maybe I'd even be one of those people that helped serve and hold the little kids or do something like that. And you, you thought, I can't do that. Look at my family I come from. I can't do that. Look what I've done in my life. I can't do that. I've got a criminal. I can't do And now you are. What used to be I can't, that is now I do. Come on, are you ready? I'm setting you up, here it comes. So what are you saying I can't do now? What are you looking at going, I can't do that. I can't do that. That, no way, I can't do that. Don't be content with your capacity. Don't be content with your capacity. How do you know what your capacity is if you don't challenge it? You'll never know. How do you know what you're capable of if you don't get beyond what you're comfortable with. Because if you stay with what you're comfortable with, you'll never challenge your capacity. And what if your capacity is not limited by God's resources, but by our own resistance? 
and our own restrictions. Again, what if my capacity is not limited by God's resources, but my own resistance oh, or my own restrictions? I don't do that. I can't do that. What if I convinced myself that I can't do what I'm now doing? If you'll allow me to walk you through some journey and where I've been an example of that in my life because I didn't bring much to the table. I was totally, totally convinced in my life at one point that I could never get in front of people and talk. And you're going, yeah, right. You, you only see one scene. You haven't seen my whole story. Let me show you part of it. I took Latin because I heard that if you take French or Spanish, you have to get up and talk in French or Spanish. Latin's not a spoken language. You don't have to get up and talk in Latin. So I took Latin. And yeah, I got lousy grades. <laughs> yeah, see, lousy grades, 2.75 GPA. And yes, it says the Ohio State University. I can't get up and give a speech. No way, I can't do that. I can't do that. <gasps> I did that, I did that. I do that. Paul. Hey, look what the Macedonian church did. If they can do that, what can you do? It's this punk kid from Cleveland that took Latin. What's stopping you from dreaming dreams God wants to put in your head and in your heart? And who are you to tell God no? I used to be the guy that I'd be driving down the road and see a jogger on the side of the road. I'd go, 10 points, 10 points, hit him, woo! That was me. That was me. My chiropractor one time was talking to me about runners and how they get addicted to it. I go, you don't have to worry about that with me. No problem there. I've owned three exercise bikes in my life. I broke the first one because I only got it for 10 bucks at the Salvation Army. And then I tried a recumbent one because I'm never going to be a runner. I hate treadmills. hate treadmills. I could never run. It's too boring. So I told the chiropractor that eventually I'm going to get a, try and get a bicycle. And then I realized the bicycle to fit my frame that would be decent was going to cost me about twice the price of my first car. And so that, that was a... That was a no-go. I had three exercise bikes because I don't run. I don't run. That's for, that's for other people. Oh, that's good for you. I'm glad you run. I'm glad you run. You're so awesome. You just keep on going. Not me. And then January 2012, I tried to run. January 2012. If you understand running and pace, this is absolutely pathetic. <laughs> this is a 15-mile-an-hour pace. I live over here, and I couldn't even make it past there. I can't do that. I can't. But I couldn't because I wouldn't. And because I didn't, I couldn't. What are you saying no to? And obviously just recently, did 31 miles. Approximately five years time. What are you saying you can't do? I can't run. But since that time, I've run 2,500 stinking miles. And some of you are going, every one of those was thinking, I bet I can't run, I hate running. How do you know? Have you tried? Have you pushed your capacity? You have no stinking idea what your capacity is until you push it. It doesn't have to be something physical. I was convinced I could never be a pastor. Hear me clearly. I would sit right about where you're sitting in my church and look up at my pastor. And he'd be just sitting, all of a sudden he'd just break out in a song and the whole congregation would start joining I would go ahead. I had a situation where he'd be serving communion. I used to love the times of communion. He'd just be sitting in communion. All of a sudden, he would just say, uh, uh, he'd just start singing, Jesus breaks every fence, and he'd just take off and go. Every pastor I knew could sing, and I can't sing. It's not that I don't try. Well, you can't because you won't, Pastor. Oh, I, I sing. I sing. It's just no one needs to hear it. It's not on pitch. It's not on key. It's on rhythm. I got rhythm. And so I'm literally convinced of myself. God's calling me to ministry, but it's not going to be a pastor. It's surely not. Scott, I'm bad. I can't sing. Every pastor I know can sing. There was something else that was spiritual that I knew I could not do. Because I had tried and I had failed. I can't fast. I can't fast. There's no way I can, I can fast. And, you know, not eat food to humble yourself before God. I tried. I read about people that do that, but that's not me. That's not me. Oh, I get, I get headaches. Oh, oh, my stomach hurts. Yeah, duh, my stomach hurts. I don't know if I can fast. I don't know if I can fast. I can't do that because I won't do that because I won't do that. I can't do that. And then I finally fasted one day. And then finally felt like we really need to take the church through a time of prayer and fasting. And I refuse to challenge people to do what I won't do. I think you lose integrity as a leader and as a person. And so I finally made, a, made it through a three-day fast. 
And last year was my third time having a seven-day fast, but I can't fast. I can't do that. And after I get uh, talking with my wife, because when I take time to fast, it, it definitely affects my family's life. From January, I'm going to attempt a 21-day fast. Never done it. Don't know if I can do it. And I won't know if I can do it unless I try it. If the Macedonian church can give what they did not have, and Paul challenged the Corinthian church, if this punk kid from Cleveland, all he brought to the table was telling God yes, what is your excuse not to go ahead and keep dreaming the dreams God dropped in your heart? What is your excuse to say, I can't, I can't, I can't? Why not say, all right, God, let's give it a shot. But I might fail. Duh. Give it a shot. You might not fail. You might increase your capacity. My, my tablet went blank, which means I spent too long at that point. All right, here we go. <laughs> How will I increase my capacity if I insist on my comfort? God cannot increase your capacity if you want to stay comfortable. That's impossible. The Macedonian church gave to their capacity and somehow God enabled them to give beyond their capacity. Why? Because he increased their capacity. How do you increase your capacity? You've got to reach it first. You've got to reach it and knock on it. When we did our capital giving campaign for the building we're sitting in back in 2010, my wife and I looked at it. We prayed over it. We looked at our income. She was working about 25 hours a week at the hospital at the time. Uh, we think over three years we can give $10,000. That's what we think we can do. And then when it came time to announce what we were going to do, we realized that didn't take any faith. Uh, we could do that if God didn't come through as long as we didn't do something stupid and lose our jobs. So we stepped up and said, okay, God, we'll, go, we'll, we'll make a faith promise of 15000 but we have no idea how it's going to happen. We can't do 15000 And halfway through the three years, we finished paying off the 15000 and increased it to 25000 And at the end of the three years, we had finished giving $25,000 that we could not do. We could not do. Where you started doesn't have to be where you stay. If you're still stuck somewhere, maybe you're not stuck. Maybe you stopped. And what if today is a great time to get started, started moving forward again? What if what you think is contentment really isn't contentment, but it's complacency? Because you're comfortable. And we all like comfort. Well, I, I'm comfortable. I, I'm, 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 reading, I'm reading three Bible verses a day. I'm comfortable with that. Stretch. Come on, there was a time where you said, I can't read the Bible, period, and now you're at least attempting. Why not keep going forward? Why not stretch? Why not stretch? All I brought to the table was a yes, man. One mile was not my capacity. Five, 5K was not my capacity. 10K was not my capacity. A marathon was not my capacity. One day of fasting was not my capacity. Three days was not my capacity. Seven days, we'll find out if that's my capacity. One Sunday morning service was not my capacity. Two Sunday morning services was not my capacity. Three. Let's stop there. We're getting a little crazy now getting a little crazy now because for about two years I told this church from the pulpit there's no way we're ever going to go through Sunday morning services the day we go to three Sunday morning services you better schedule your pastor's funeral how, how many of you were there you heard me say that come on come on yeah yeah when you were there yeah that's what I said there's no way I can't do that we don't know what we can't do until we push through. Paul ends the passage and he says this, hey, that's what prompted us to ask Titus to bring the relief offering to your attention for the church in Jerusalem. So that was so well begun could be finished up. You do so well in many things, Corinthian church, you wealthy church, you. You trust God, you're articulate, you're insightful, you're passionate, you love us. Now do your best in this too. But I'm not as good at giving. Do your best in this too. I'm not trying to order you around against your will. But by bringing in the Macedonians' enthusiasm as a stimulus to your love, I'm hoping to bring out the best in you. Basically, Paul's going, hey, Corinthians, I'm writing you this whole letter, and by the way, you need to give in this offering, and I'm sending Titus to you, because so much has already been done. You've got what it takes. Finish this up. And for some of you, you've been coming, you've been attending, you've been watching, listening, enjoying, growing, and consuming, but you have yet to enter in to investing and giving in this local church. And maybe the Christmas offering is a great simple stepping stone for you to move out of a spectator mindset and into a participant in giving and investing mindset. But notice verse 8 in the scripture there. No one has authority to command you to give it an offering. If in a previous church situation, you've had people get in your business about your giving and tell you what you have to do on giving, anything aside from you should, the, the biblical command to tithe to a local church, anything about an offering past the tithe, no one has the ability or the authority to command that of you. The scripture even shows us right here in this passage, it's the grace 
of giving the offering. It's a grace that God gives. What would Flag Church 2010 say to Flag Church 2017? Because Flag Church 2010 would say, we could build a new building if we would build a new building, but we won't build a new building. So we didn't, and we're still over there. Instead, we said, God can, we will, he did. What's next? Last thought. What God does in you is greater than what he does through you right now. What God does in you is greater than what he does through you right now. I can't do that much, Pastor. Maybe you're part of the 30% of our county or a city that's on disability. I can't do that much. My greatest giving testimony is when I didn't have much. If you've heard the testimony before, thanks for being patient. I was laid off from UPS. I was living at a fraction of an address. My roommate moved out. I'm working at the church 20 hours a week at six bucks an hour with a custodian, which my parents thought was hysterical because I couldn't keep my room clean, and now I'm keeping the church clean. So my paycheck was $98.84. I'm sitting second row right about where Ryan's sitting, and there's a missionary that wasn't exactly thrilling, but it was a missionary service on a midweek service, and the pastor said, hey, we're going to take an offering for our mission. Let's all bow our heads and pray and see what God wants us to give, and everyone did what they normally do. They bowed their head and wrote their check. So I bowed my head and prayed what God wanted me to give, and he whispered to my heart, give your entire paycheck that's in your wallet. And I did what any reasonable Christian would do. I prayed again. <laughs> and then I signed the check and then put it in the offering plate. And an usher before I left tried to get me to take it back. And I said no. The next day I got called into my pastor's office because he said, Mark, we received a good offering. We, your check's not, well, we're going to be okay with that. And I just wouldn't look him in the eye. And he wisely let me sacrifice because he knew what God was doing in me was way more important than what God was doing through me at $98.84. And yeah, there was some blessing, major blessing a couple years that came out of that, but that's not the point. The point was what God did in me prepared me for giving down the road. So it does not, it is absolutely irrelevant the amount that you think God can do through you. It's what he wants to do in you. And then, then Paul goes uh, nuclear on him with the last verse he challenges the corinthian church hey we want you to help give hey let me tell you what these poor macedonian people did hey we want you to give and then he goes nuclear and he throws in the worst example of all jesus and he goes you're familiar with the generosity of our master jesus right rich as he was he gave it all away for us and in one stroke he became poor and we became rich stand with me if you would zeke can you bring your team up friend couple simple questions for you do you feel like you're part of the macedonian church you're going through some severe trial and maybe you are that you're you're in extreme poverty and maybe you are that does not mean you cannot walk around with overflowing joy and you can still operate in generosity generosity is not based on what you put in the bucket generosity is what basis what is based on what's still in your wallet when you're putting something in the bucket or maybe you're part of the corinthian church the macedonian church is filled with joy maybe you're part of the corinthian church where you're pretty comfortable but the joy doesn't seem to be there and it would be hard-pressed for you to be found guilty on, in trial, to be found guilty of being extravagant or generous. How do you know what you're capable of? And you're capable of some ridiculously amazing things. You're living in some dreams that you used to dream that you thought you'd never get to. How do you know what you're capable of if you won't challenge yourself and get out of that comfort area? And that could be a physical thing, it could be a spiritual thing, it could be a giving thing like we're talking today. I would just challenge you with this. What are you living in that used to be a dream? And what dream could you live to see? If you start worrying more about your conditioning than your conditions around you, and you would stop staying in the complacency and your comfort and receive the challenge that God might give. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and your hearts this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. It takes us farther than we ever thought we could go. And then when we get there, it doesn't let us stay there. I thank you for that, Lord. I thank you for that. Father, I ask that as music starts up, it would just make us aware that your presence is already here and that we would respond to you with generous praise.